He's an author. He's an amazing speaker as well. He's co-founder of Red Shoe Living. Would you want to just give us a little intro to who you are? Yeah, yeah, you bet. So Red Shoes Living is a, it's really a mindset and a framework that I created, gosh, 20, it's going to make me sound old, 20 plus years ago. And the concept was created really to get people through difficult times in corporations when corporations were being acquired and brought together and people were being let go and there was lots of change. And it was a way to really help individuals as you go through that process, kind of keep your, your spirit alive, your soul alive, and to continue to perform at a high level and not really compress. And along the way, we developed a, a framework around that that turned into kind of a leadership component. It turned into a culture, a company culture component. It turned into a customer experience component. And then it turned into the way one lives their life. So in theory, when you um, stand out for the positive in the way that you work and the way that you live, you stand out like when you put a pair of red shoes on. And, um, and that's really the concept. So it's kind of a catchy, sticky thing for people and, and becomes very personal to them in terms of how they use it and apply it. So that's what I do. Wow. You must be busy right now since this is such a, um, a rocky time for, for corporations in America. Yeah, and just, and we're about to get busier with that, with, you know, kind of people in, in certain parts of the world, of course, emerging, specifically in the United States. So companies are starting to come out of this, and employees, you know, I think we'll have remote work um, uh, environments for a long time. But how do we come out of this in a way that um, is, is different, as it's going to be, and even better? Is there a way to make our work lives and our personal lives as we emerge even maybe better than they were before? with all the perspective we've had during this pandemic. So yeah, we're about to get busier. Um, you know, there's a lot of leaders and executive teams right now reaching out saying, hey, you know, we wanna re-inspire our team and give them a little different mindset as we come out of this. And so that's, that's where we're spending a lot of our time. Lonnie, can you hear me now? We've got you, Terry. All right, yeah, it's like, you know, I, I didn't know if you could hear me or not, but um, I, I could hear you now. And I'm so excited that you are making such a difference and impact with what you do. I've, uh, you know, I've watched what you've been doing and this message is so important right now for everyone. And um, tell us how, how we can ignite um, our, our own human potential. And I love some of your pillars that you talk about um, with your book. I know you have a new book out. And, how, and why you even started all of this. Um, so yeah. tell me some of those pillars and, and how we can implement some of those things. Yeah, and if I may, Terry, uh, Nancy Williams, Red Shoes Living Chief of Staff is on Facebook. Um, so if there are any questions that come in specifically, she'll, she's oh, awesome. much more Red Shoes than I am. Let me put it that way. <laughs> right. She'll be able to answer some of those questions along the way too. And yeah, as Ali and I were chatting, you know, it the concept came about some time ago. And, um, you know, I recognize that there's really an empathetic view to Red Shoes Living that when you're working with people and spending as much time as we do with the people that we work with and play with and live with and all these things, that we all have these incredible stories. We're all different. We're all unique. And yet in the corporate world, in the business world, we ask all of that diversity to kind of follow one mission, one vision. And, um, and sometimes that can be uninspiring to the individual. And so we wanted to find a way to actually reverse that model and go back. Um, Terry, what's red shoes for you as I kind of walk through it is going to be different than what's red shoes for Aaliyah or what's red shoes for me. And so that model and reversing that says as a leader, as a human being, we have to connect at the core of what's important to you and be able to, we say, tap into that and bring that back into the business and understand it, pay attention to it, empathize with it, and then tie that back to the, the mm -hmm. mission, vision, values of the company. And that, that standard is, is very high. So as leaders, it's difficult to do. And then there's always the line of how far should we take that? What's appropriate? Um, but we found that when we do that, uh, you know, we get the best out of people. There's still accountability. We still hold people you know, accountable to being their best version of their self. So it's really seeing the human being first and then the title of the individual, if you will, second in every single, you know, environment. Wow. So as Ali and I were chatting, as you were coming on, Terry, you know, standing out for the positive in our work and in our personal lives, that, that we define that, you know. And so 
again, tying that back together becomes important. So when we move down the path of that, we said, what are the common traits? What are the common pillars between everybody in the world? And in fact, it's what's interesting to me through this pandemic is we're seeing it. You know, we're seeing that the ego goes away, the title goes away, and you have two people that don't really care, you know, where you are in the world, and they're sitting together saying, what can I do to support you? And, you know, and conversely, mm-hmm. that, that's Red Shoes. What we did is we got together, and this is 20 plus years ago, and said, what are the common traits? And we wanted to keep the framework of Red Shoes Living simple so we all could apply to it. So we, we literally listed over a thousand different attributes and traits, and love was one of them. And we thought, you know, we probably can't at that time bring love into the business world. It's not going to resonate. It's probably a little too warm, even though we know it's there. So we, we came down to five. There are five pillars. The first one is awareness. And each one of these pillars um, can be applied back to leadership, customer experience, culture, and the way we live our life. And they also represent like awareness is the first one is being aware that in the world today, there's a lot of noise. Um, Mm -hmm. Some of that noise is negative. Some of it is positive, of course, but how do we turn down the negative noise so we can actually see the human being so we can actually connect with the human being. Awareness is also saying we need to be aware of our, our mental health as leaders and our our physical health, if you will, if we want to perform at the highest level. It's being aware of great red shoes experiences that are happening right in front of us. And in fact, as it relates to that first pillar of awareness, we say, as a red shoes leader, one that stands out for the positive, you have to either witness a great red shoes experience or you have to participate in one. So awareness becomes the gateway to everything, you know, that just heightened level of attention to the individual that's standing right in front of you. So that's the first one. And the second one is gratitude. You know, we've, and and Terry, and you know, I know you and uh, Ellie are exactly this type of uh, individual, but gratitude is the number one trait that we find with successful people. Love that. Yeah, yeah. People are gracious for where they are in their career. And we don't define success. We just have, we've interviewed over 1,200 people and said, you know, what are the secrets to your success? And gratitude always shows up. Hmm. I think, you know, gratitude says that even though we're going through tough times, what can we be grateful for? Um, Hmm. If we had a relationship that is no longer, you know, um, what in that relationship were we grateful for during that time, right? So it's really looking at every piece of adversity, everything, and trying to find something that was, that you're grateful for and that was good. And what we found there is that grateful human beings are open. They're, you know, they're um, willing to let people come in. They're vulnerable. We're seeing a lot of vulnerability right now with with leaders um, trying to help their employees feel safe. And so they're sharing more of their story. I love that because I, you know, how often has, have the work world or the corporate world thought of vulnerability as weakness? Right. And now we are looking at it as strength. Yeah. And yeah. they are they are having to to be leaders right now. Absolutely. And in fact this week, you know, I've it's Wednesday and already I've met with probably four executives um and in every case we were vulnerable with each other in terms of what we were experiencing because when you when you level that and you come to that place then you can build from there. Mm-hmm. You can really achieve. Un, ungrateful leaders by the way are small. They, their world is small and and they keep it close to themselves and the vulnerability is not there. And it, it's very hard to trust that type of leadership. It's very hard to follow that type of leadership. Mm-hmm. So gratitude, you know, that's a practice that we bring in. Um, so that's number two. Number three is everybody has a story, just what you said. Yeah. And this is really the, the empathy aspect of it. You know, today, everybody's working remote. Everybody has their own story. Um, connecting with those stories as a leader as a human being becomes really really important you have some people that are home alone Mm -hmm. they have nobody there you have other people that their children are home from school they have pets and um, i was on a call with a 401k company that i'm doing some work with here about two weeks ago and i spoke with a lady and in the middle of the conversation she paused and i said are you okay and she said my husband of 72 years or who's 72 years old and has liver cancer Um, just walked by me and I was just watching how slow he was walking and I'm so concerned. In an instant, I realized she's not, she's not in a corporate office. My mind assumed and she was home 
you know? And so we just stopped and paused and talked about her husband for just a minute. And that wow. was part of her story. Yes. You know, so like, there's going to be so many stories that come from this, uh, yeah. amazing stories. Yeah. And, and I think, yes. I, I think understanding those stories, um, you know, becomes critically important. In fact, we have people today that will say, they'll ask a question with their team. You know, they'd say, Terry, where are you at today on a scale from one to 10? 10 being amazing and one being not so great. And it's, they're, they're trying to discover and maybe in a little more efficient way um, where the baseline is. You know, if you're at a six and a seven, that's probably not too bad under current circumstances. If you're in a two, three, and four, we probably need to have a deeper discussion. Let's talk about that. And what can I do to help get you to a five, six, and seven? And that changes daily. Yes, I'm sure it does. So are you working with corporations now and companies and in, in during yeah. this time and, and trying to, and, and has the narrative changed? Yeah, well, it's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Nancy Williams, our chief staff, again, who's, who's uh, on on Facebook, um, will tell you that we feel like we're not doing enough. We met yesterday and said we need to be doing more because we know how powerful the message is, especially at this time. And so we're getting ready to um, get even busier and doing, doing some work with companies. But we work with, um, I mean, we have our, our speaking business, which, like both of you, just changed overnight. You know, we've done virtual events. And so for us, the biggest part of our business that's growing is actually going in and working with the leadership teams and executive teams and taking this Red Shoes Living uh, mindset and framework into them. And, and that we can do that pretty effectively through Zoom. And there's a cadence mm -hmm. to it. And so that, but what we've learned is um, leaders are carrying such a load today. And that's the reason we start with them is you know they they're trying to make everybody that they work with still feel safe and that started almost immediately but now you've got people that are no longer working you know in an organization where they've worked for 20 years and they have a friend that is working and so you've actually got people that with survivor's guilt you know because um, they're getting paid and somebody else isn't true true i've noticed that with mm -hmm. some people yeah i i feel that way as um just as a a normal person because i know people here that have in the tourism industry, for example, you know, Italy is, is one of its biggest industries is tourism and no one is working right now. The tour guides, the people that own the bed and breakfast, you know, the little mom and pop hotels and the big hotels as well. And they are all without jobs, probably for the whole year. Yeah. And I've had this kind of survivor guilt of, gosh, I wish I could, I could help them. I wish I feel bad that almost that it hasn't happened to me in some way, you know, because it's horrible to see that many people around that you love just have their the whole world taken out from under them without much explanation and justification that, that makes you feel good. You That's know? right, yeah. And so, you know, in an, in an instance like this, you, the question would be for us would be, how would you red shoes that? You know, how do you red shoes as somebody transitions out of a company? Um, there's a way to actually do that in a red shoes, shoes way. It's not a positive experience, but what can we do to make sure as they depart the company to make that experience as, as good as mm. possible? Right. So your mind is constantly thinking about that or people that have been furloughed. You know, there, there needs to be a communication plan with people that have been furloughed um, that's red shoes because they're still part of something, even though they've been furloughed. And so how do you communicate with them? So these are the types of things that we're talking about. In, in, in the can, instance, can you of, lead us through like a one minute little like really fast session of like this is what we do. Yeah. It's really helpful. Yeah. So, so here's the beauty of Red Shoes Living. If, if you ask yourself the question and everything that you do, what I'm about to do is at Red Shoes. Just that one question, that mindset says, you know, how, how do I show up for you on this Facebook live event in a Red Shoes way? I need hmm. to be on time and in fact early. I need to be prepared and polished, right? I need to be open and vulnerable like these are the the way that your mind thinks so whether it's a positive thing that's happening or a negative thing you put the red shoes mindset at the center and then these pillars these five pillars that we were walking through that becomes the foundation you come home to mm -hmm. without without the pillars you have the mindset so let's say we go you know restaurants start to open we go back to a restaurant server comes up immediately we're seeing a human being first that we know has a story that we haven't connected with yet, that is a server second, right? That is serving us. So if we create an environment that is red shoes for them and they step into that, 
how much better is that service potentially going to be? What kind of a connection can we make? And so, you know, we're changing the experience. It takes a little bit of work on both sides, right? Sometimes we have to bring people into our environment to, to make them red shoes. Sometimes we have to remind people. That's why awareness, Terry, becomes such a big part of this. Yes, so, I, I was just going to mention that. I mean, if, if we're so busy in the future or the, or the past or, or our old thinking, it's really a challenge to be aware of, of these pillars. But I, I think red does stand out. So I think yeah. wearing red shoes, that's why I'm wearing red today. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and I, I do think, you know, we have to kind of snap ourselves out of that. And I, I do think we're, we're, what you are teaching, what Red Shoes is teaching is really bringing us back to the basics. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Of humanity. Right. And, and I mean, Lonnie, is this something that you believe, like, especially since this is such a rare time right now where everything has been completely shaken up? I mean, is this something that you believe could literally we could adopt for the rest of yeah. our yes. way. Yes. Not so, even life, like all of you know, a di truly a different way of thinking and a different way of living that yeah. us as a community. Yeah. What I what I would tell you is it was designed because there was so much noise in the world that mm -hmm. these these concepts, this concept is actually not mine, it's ours. The noise of business, the noise of KPIs and metrics and money and it, all of which is important to run a big company or the noise in our personal lives that happen, um, it, it becomes so large, we forget the basic things. We forget kindness. We forget awareness. You know, Terry, like you said, um, if we're not living in the present, if we're planning, you know, way too ahead in the future, we never actually get there. And if we're just living in the past, we can't get out of it. And so we get in the flow. We stay, you know, right in the moment. So what we discovered, it's, it's in some cases, it's a reminder of what people already know. In, in the busy, noisy corporate world where people were driving fast, it was easy to wake them up in one hour. And we knew that. We could wake them up in an hour and say, look, we're going to tell you something you already know. And as Nancy would say, if she was on the audio with us, she would say, once you know this and know it again, you're never going to forget it. Wow. And it's going to haunt you. So when you don't apply it... It, it haunts you and you're like, ah, I could have, I could have created a red shoes moment or I could have been such a better leader or I could have created, you know, more in the culture. I could have contributed more or during this time, you know, if, if red shoes for me was being healthy and I wasn't healthy, I, gosh, I know better. Why did I not do that? Wow. So, so is, do you create like an experience? So when they experience in the, in the inside or in their body or, or, or they're living it, they're, they're taking action that once they experience that, it's, it's almost like a, a good drug, right? Oh yeah, it I is. Want to go back to it. Yeah. So here's a curse though. And I, I want to finish on the pillars too, because I yeah. just for those that are listening in, I think this will be helpful for them, but there is a curse to this. And I literally call it the curse of red shoes. And that is, is that a red shoes leader believes there's always a better way. There's always more you can do to stand out. And early on, we were putting so much pressure on executive teams and leaders to stand out on everything they did from an email they wrote to how they answered the phone to how they communicated to the products they were, you know, and service they were providing that it was never good enough because you could keep red shoes, you know, the, the, the thing further. So what we said is you have to know when good is good enough. When I wrote the book, I drove the team mm -hmm. crazy that I wrote the book with because they kept saying, Lonnie, this is red shoes. And I'm like, no, we could, we could do better. So you have to know, and the way I always describe it is once we can go back on vacation, you know, and go back on a beach, a red shoes leader in the old days would sit on that beach and go, you know what, there's probably a better beach. I could probably create a better experience for my loved ones that are with me. What we ah. said, once in a while, you just have to sit there and say, look, this is a good enough beach. It's red shoes already. This, the book is red shoes already. We've thought as much through this as we possibly can. And so here's, here's one other thing I have to share with you. Once you catch this concept, and I'll finish the pillars, and it becomes part of you, it becomes very passionate because it's yours. It's your personal red shoes view of the world. As you elevate that game up, and let's say on a scale from one to 10, you're already an, an amazing red shoes person, and you're at a seven. Your seven right there as you start to develop more of the red shoes mindset is better than most people's tens because the level of awareness and the application of the framework that you're applying and so even nancy some days will say to me hey lana you're at a four but because you're red shoes your four is probably better than most people's tens but you need yep. to be at a seven you need to be at an eight you need you need to work here you need to be doing more of this like she holds me accountable 
to that to that level, right? Yeah. So just to recap, if I may, really quick, and then I'll turn it back over to you guys on the pillars. You so you have awareness. Um, it gets applied in all those categories we talked about. You have gratitude. You have everybody has a story. So connecting with each other's stories on a daily basis, the people that you work with or for your family, they change every day. Nancy will ask me what my story is for the day. And she gauges her, her interaction with me and experience based on where I'm at. And I do the same with her. Mm. So that's number three. Number four is kindness and respect. Some of the, the, the most fiercely competitive, uh, hardest charging leaders that I've met in my life are also kind and respectful. Doesn't mean that they don't hold you accountable. They're going to hold you accountable to whatever it is the company or, you know, the sports team is doing, um, but they're going to do it in a kind and respectful way. So in, in return, you want to run through walls for them. Kindness and respect today. In fact, through the pandemic, I'm seeing so much kindness, so much respect yeah. from the healthcare workers and the doctors and the scientists. And I mean, just, you know, and so applying that, becomes incredibly powerful. Before pandemic, it was even more powerful. Now we're seeing more of it, which is a beautiful thing. So the fifth one, after kindness and respect, is put yourself out there. You have to act. You have to do. So for me to create a Red Shoes experience or to be a Red Shoes leader or to be a Red Shoes human being, I like to try to go through all five of those in an instant. So sometimes you get through the first four, but if I don't do something um, for both of you, if I don't do something, like if I don't show up on the show or if I don't follow back up or if we've talked about something that's important to you and I don't acknowledge that and do something, then the red shoes moment is incomplete for me. Mm. That's how I take it. If that mm. makes sense. So Lonnie, it's not just sitting in the background is what you're saying. You can be thinking these things, but it's actually doing something. You got to do. You got to do. You got to you write a handwritten note to somebody that says, look, I, I, I saw what you did. It was amazing. And I just wanted to thank you for that. Or whatever it is. And, and Terry, to that point, the most powerful form of red shoes is subtle and small. Mm. The most powerful red shoes leaders that I've worked with are quiet, um, not talking all the time like I do or loud. Um, it's the little things that sometimes make the biggest difference and create the best red shoes experiences mm -hmm. that I've seen. So yeah, I completely agree. I mean, how about the times when you're in a grocery store? I think about this and I, if I consciously want to make a difference, just smiling at someone saying without any words, I see you and I don't know what your story is, but I see you. And you know, you know, those moments where they, they go, Oh my goodness, that person just looked at me in a way that I, you know, might've changed that person's day or their life. Right. And um, that's what I feel like you're, you're saying, and it, it just, it's taking everything. And, and you these pillars are just such great um, lessons for all of us. In, in all areas of our life is, is how I look at this. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and you are a great example of this. I, I've seen you, you know, live this way. And an acknowledgement is such a big, big part of it. And you just, I don't think that we acknowledge people enough. We're usually looking at what people are doing wrong instead yeah. of acknowledging what they're doing right or just who they are. Yeah. So I just Especially in the corporate environment. Yes. Right. Yes. You know, that's, the, that's the way to communicate, I feel like, in the corporate environment much of the time. Yeah. You know, we've seen, um, when, we've seen things like this in the corporate environment where we start to apply these things as a leader. Um, you might be in a meeting and, you know, maybe there's an interaction in that meeting between a leader and his teammate where there's lots of people that isn't, isn't the same as it normally is. Maybe it's a little bit rough or a little bit curt or a little bit angry. And I've watched leaders pause because awareness kicks in, because that becomes the gateway, right? Mm -hmm. And they pause for a minute, and they say, you know what, let me say that again. I really apologize. I know that came across a little bit direct and maybe unkind, and I didn't mean it to, and I'm aware that I just did that. that that's red shoes already right there. What I was right. really trying to say is you're doing a good job, but I need you to do more. Mm -hmm. I need you to do whatever. That moment is red shoes, hopefully for both, both parties. So oh, beautiful. We have a lot. Of, we have a lot of great questions coming in for Lonnie. Um, let's see. So we have. Is it Janelle uh, from? I know from Italy. Um, incredible philosopher and educate and educator talks about the caring circle and how your action, how your action has to reach the other person and come back to you to make it complete. Yeah, I love um, that. I love that. And so that's interesting because. 
you know, I've been in situations myself where you, you think you're connecting and you put it out there, but if you don't, if it's not actually coming back and being received the way you think it is, then it is incomplete, you know? And so there, there, there is a real, at the end of the day, I, I made a comment at a conference I spoke at one time. I said, at the end of the end of a day, a red shoes leader should be exhausted. And a lady came up to me afterwards and she said, I understood what you were trying to say. She said, but wouldn't a red shoes leader actually sleep well at night instead of being totally exhausted? And she started to explain that to me. And I thought about that and, and she's right. You know, we should be nourished and feel good about it. Um, it's not always about giving it all away. It is taking it back the other way as well to, to fill you up, you know, so. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, so it's something I actually teach um, with, I'm a, I'm a public speaking coach, Lonnie, as well as an actress. And it's one of the things I teach is active listening, that it's not just about you, right? You have to listen to who you're talking to, especially in live video, like with Zoom, but even in, in, even when you're in front of a big audience, you really have to listen to the other person. And a lot of times what you find is by the end, you, if you've really been actively listening, meaning I am aware of what you are doing and giving me as much as what I am doing and giving you, by the end, you're usually rather tired because it's, it takes a lot of energy to be that open and receive yeah. and really, you know, read all the signals. But it is such, so much more of a complete and beautiful and compassionate experience and your relationship with that person or those people is so much fuller and more real because of it. But I do find it very tiring yeah. if you've done it well. You know, I, I have a, a comment or a, a little secret that I was taught because I totally agree with you there. And in fact, when I would speak, um, people wanted to share their stories and how they connected with it. And, you know, and I would, it, it was, it was, tiring because they were such deep stories and this sounds completely disrespectful and I I didn't know how to respond and I was speaking with a friend of mine a, a Jewish rabbi one time and he and he I was exp explaining this to him and he said to me Lonnie I understand that feeling because as a rabbi you know there's very um, deep conversations and I would mm. and serious conversations and I would be so tired at the end of the night so somebody told him that if you connect and crack somebody open in a way that's emotionally meaningful. It's your responsibility to hear them out. And he said, and so here's what I did. He said, I, I started listening. That's all he said. And I said, explain. And he said, what I was doing was trying to solve. And I, I quickly just started listening to the stories, honoring the fact, and Terry, you made this comment earlier, seeing them as a human being. It didn't mean I had to solve everything right then. Right. Exactly. What you're trying to do is solve everything for them in your own mind or even verbally they just want you to listen. So what it did for me now, one of my favorite things is that after an event, when people want to come up and share their stories, I just listen, you know, and if I can offer something up, I do. And it's become so much more meaningful to me because, and I think for them too, you know, it's just this place of coming together and sharing some stories that are meaningful for each other. And the other part of it is for me that I've discovered is I learn from them. Yeah. in their story and how they tell it to me and process it, I learn something that I can now take back to my own red shoes way of doing things and go, Ooh, I really like what you said. And I'm going to try, I'm going to start applying that. So red shoes is an evolution. It's not, no longer mine. Everybody contributes to it. It's always a new idea, a new way of doing things. And so it's kind of exciting. Wow. I just love yeah. this conversation. I really, you know, I, I just think about listening such a gift such a gift. We all want to be heard and, 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 and listen to, think about our children, you know, how, how much of the time we were trying to fix them or change them or give them advice. And all they really wanted is for us to listen to them. Um, so it's a really, it's a really a gift. Um, and I have another question for you, Lonnie, you know, I, and I don't want to get, finish I, this conversation or interview without knowing this. I know that you have a story and I'm just, you know, I'm so curious about where this came from for you to have this passion to come up with these pillars and red shoes living. I would, and I know it's probably in your book, which I want to make sure everyone knows how to get a hold of your book. But tell us a little yeah. bit about, you know, where this came from within you. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting, Terry, there's the story for me is still evolving in terms of, um, things that I've discovered, like many people do later in life about my childhood and in various things there. So it's been interesting for me to kind of look back even deeper to that question. But as I was growing up, uh, 
I had great examples um, in my family of this, and we were taught to, um, you know, always see people for who they are at a very early age. My grandmother, who helped raise me, my father passed away. So here's here's the crazy part of the story. My father was a professional wrestler and um, died when I was 10 years old. My mother and my father had been separated for a couple of years when he passed away. But when I would spend time um, with my father, I would watch how he interacted with his fans. And I, I do talk about this in the book, but he treated everybody with kindness and respect. It's similar to, in fact, he, he wrestled um, Dwayne Johnson's father, Rocky Johnson. So, wow. uh, yeah. <laughs> So The Rock, you know, I mean, I'm wearing red shoes and he's the highest paid actor in the world. So I, somewhere, I don't know what happened, where I went wrong, but um, he, th he's a great example, by the way, of what I'm talking about. He's fiercely competitive. He outworks everybody. You know, he wants his product to be the best, but he literally treats people with as much kindness, respect, and accountability to be their best as anybody I've ever seen. But I had, I had these experiences where I watched my dad who could have had this larger than life ego, but he didn't. And when he passed away, thousands of people showed up to his funeral to honor stories about him giving his wrestling boots away and various things. My mother was the same way. You know, to this day, my mother is probably the best example of red shoes. She kind and sweet and, you know, uh, stands out for the positive. My grandmother, and I'll share this quote with you, my dad's mother who welded ships when she was eight months pregnant with my father during World War II. Whole story behind that, I've also written in the book. Um, she had a quote that when I was growing up, she would tell me, and she, she was always concerned about one's ego. And she said, we all bring some ego to everything we do, but you have to think, Lonnie, about your intention. What intention are you bringing to this Facebook Live today? What ego are you bringing to this? And once you understand what that is, you can gauge it. You can move it. And sometimes we need to move our ego up a little bit. Sometimes we need to move it down. So she taught us that. And then the quote was that she would tell me all the time, treat those who have more than you as equals and those who have less than you as kings and queens. We'd and say that one more time. Say that yes. one more time. Treat them. Say treat those who have more than you, whatever more is, as equals. Mm -hmm and those who have less than you as kings and queens. And she would say, if you live your life that way, it'll count for plenty. And I am definitely not perfect. Um, you know, no one is, but I, I try to keep that in my mind every single day. So when I go back and think of my father, and I go back and think of my grandfather, and I go back and think of the mentors I've had, that, that level of respect, the world that they create, the space that they create for you to step in and, and be your best self, that's what that quote is really all about. So, so I, it's, it's been in me. And then my, as my father passed away, my uncle was a turnaround guy. And every summer I would travel with him and go, he'd have me come into meetings and I watched him hard charging executive, but from the front office receptionist, when he walked in the door to the people in the plants, to the people in the office, there was an accountability that was always there, but he treated people with such kindness and respect. When he passed, the same thing happened. You know, thousands of people showed up to tell stories about <clears throat> these moments in time where he created what I now call a red shoes experience for them. And so people would run through walls for him. So that, that's just been in me. And I thought whatever I do in my life, whether it's, you know, corporate America or going to the grocery store, I want that to show up um, and do my part in that. So... Okay. So, you are. Can, I, can I ask like as a almost like a next natural lead from from your story to this question I've, I've had is so in this time right now which is a very tumultuous time for all of us and for some people it's been a positive time for many reasons finding silver linings you know having time to do things many of us don't have time at all to do things because right. we have young children but or work that we're trying you know but there are there's there's a lot going on. So how do we hold on to a sense of purpose and reason to show up and get excited every day in such a moody, tumultuous time? Yeah. Like coming from your story, I think you can directly apply that, but I just want to hear it from you. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, and I include myself in this, I think everyone is, is going through that, right? And you think about, you know, like Simon Sinek talks about knowing your why. And a lot of people talk about knowing your purpose. Well, a lot of that has changed, you know, and, and I've been talking a lot about rhythm. You know, we had, we had a cadence and a rhythm to us that had been developed over years and years and years and years. And then all of a sudden it was completely shattered 
And so, you know, we, we probably woke up at some level the first couple of weeks and thought, oh, this is great. I know we had a lot of friends that were, hey, let's do happy hour and we're all home. And, the, you know, then the kids weren't in school and then the dogs were running in front of Zoom, like all that stuff happened. And it, and it humanized us in, in, in a fun way. But then, you know, by about week three, then what is the purpose? Am I going to keep my job? I, you know, I love my partner, but now they're sitting with me working every single day. And, you know, so the rhythm became um, confusing and people struggled, including me, you know, I, now we can't go outside or, you know, now I used to get up really early and do X work, but you know, I need to make breakfast for the children or I need to make lunch or a friend's calling me who didn't work anyway and said, Hey, since you're not working, can we go on a hike? You know, or so I, for, for me, I've had to sit in some of those moments. What I used to do is if I had a moment like that, I just, I put myself out there. I just created action. I would just say, well, let's just figure this out. Let's redesign the strategy, redesign my personal purpose, set my goals and wake up and, and go. And that's what I did for years and years. Well, I couldn't do that. And so I, like everybody else, went through a little bit of a rhythm shift. And I felt guilty at times about it. You know, if I sat in it, literally sat, there's a couch in my office that I would sit on and go, what should I be doing right now? I think I should be working, but work has changed. And so I had to look at this and say, there's a new purpose. There's a new rhythm. And you know, I think incrementally and slowly, and then you reach out to your, what I call model of sustainability, your, your friends, family, and mentors, everyone started to talk about that. And everybody started, just like what we're doing now, we're sharing some of these thoughts and ideas. And slowly the rhythm started to change. Slowly you started to accept the new way, not in its entirety, because we still don't know what it's going to be, you know, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, but it's going to be different. And the purpose came back, you know, in fact, we, Nancy and I, again, our chief of staff, we froze for about three weeks mm -hmm. because we had personal stuff going on. I had some personal stuff going on and then we woke up to the purpose again and said, wait a minute, we need to share this message to help with what you just asked me the question on people to kind of start coming back out of this, you know? Yes. And that's where we're at. Yes, yeah. I think. Yeah. So I, it's a long response, but that's the way we're looking at it now. So love it. Love it. I think we are. I, I love how you say we have snapped out of it. Like all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I, I we need to start living again <laughs> yeah. or figure out how to do that or how to, how to, you know, live our full potential, even though this is unknown. I mean, I think that's where we, I've been at in the last week or two. It was like, you know, I can still, I can still envision an amazing life and, and, and living my full potential, even though I don't know what's going to happen. Right. So how do we do that? Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's a little bit, if, you know, for, for anybody, probably everybody that's ever gone through a breakup or a relationship, it's almost like that. You know, we, we broke up with our rhythm. And, and all of a sudden, you know, we, we had a new partner or, or not and a new rhythm. And so we had to kind of figure out who, who are we now? Who do we want to be? Uh, an Indian uh, friend of mine said to me on Monday, he said, you know, Lonnie, one of the things that's occurred to me going through this is what has this opened up for me? Hmm. What is the new opportunity? Whether it's professionally or personally. So one of the things he's been doing now that he's, he's in Switzerland right now, but he's getting out a little bit and he's getting out, in the, excuse me, getting out into nature, which is something he's never done before. He's never actually heard the birds. And he, he made the observation the other day, the reason he's hearing the birds wow. is awareness is up, but there's less cars, there's less noise in the world. So when yeah. you think about kind of the, you know, how that, that uh, analogy connects with Red Shoes Living, it was always about turning the noise down and doing the things we know we should be doing. Well, naturally that's happened. If we pay attention, you're going to hear the birds. The sun, literally, as I'm talking to you right now, the afternoon sun here in Park City, Utah is beautiful. And it's just starting to kind of poke out. My awareness immediately kicked in. I went, oh, here's that, here's that time of day. It's my new rhythm. I probably didn't pay as much attention to it pre-COVID-19. You know, that makes sense. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That I think the silver lining right now is that this has quiet, the, the noise has been quieted down. And now we can hear our own, um, our own heart, our own soul, our, our human spirit, and really what we're all about. And Lonnie, you know, we could talk for hours about this. And, you know, I, I first of all just want to thank you for passing along your legacy from your family. 
and really making a change. Mm -hmm. And I know that just by listening today that I, I'm going to start you know, living a red shoe living, right? right. And um, I'd like everyone, all of our audience right now, we have tons of questions. I'd like to wrap this up with how we can get a hold of you, how they can get a hold of your book, and, and also maybe just answer a few questions. And anybody listening right now, we will answer your questions and we'll reach out to Lonnie and make sure that he gets your, your questions. Yeah, th thank you. And so first and foremost, on the questions or any questions you might be thinking about, I'm gonna give you my email address. Um, it's Lonnie at redshoesliving.com. If you go to our website, either redshoesliving.com or LonnieMain.com, Nancy, who is the ultimate in red shoes leadership, has her email and phone number on there and you can connect with her. We respond to everything, every text message, every email. Sometimes it takes us a little bit of time. Um, and we would love for you to read the book. It's, it's, a, it's a very straightforward and meaningful read. Um, you can buy, it's Red Shoes Living, Standing Out for the Positive and How You Work and Live. Um, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, the audiobook is about 30 days out. Uh, through the pandemic, it was delayed a little bit. Um, you can get it on uh, Kindle, of course. And um, yeah, I mean, we're on the social channels. Uh, I, it, the other part of this really quick, and we'll answer the questions, is that we are learning as much from kind of the community of Red Shoes leaders than we are trying to put back out because people are finding new ways to live their life in a Red Shoes way, and it is incredibly inspiring. So we become better when people share their stories, communicate with us. So we're thankful and grateful for all of that. Thank you so much, Lonnie. Thanks so much. So Elliot, do you, I know that I think Nancy is responding to some of your, uh, some of the comments oh, there. Um, so Ellie, I don't know if you've seen some of those that you want to respond I, to or not. I'm now I'm on my cell phone. I'm doing the Facebook Live through my cell phone, so I can't see any comments. Okay, so, I was, so maybe you can ask them, Terry. Perfect. Well, one, I just love. So Janelle, which we, uh, I, I, I had her question earlier, but she said, oh my goodness, oh my God. Um, Lonnie, I've watched your dad wrestle. Oh, no way. Great. It's a yeah, small awesome. world, isn't it? It's yeah. A small well, I took, just, world. just so Janelle knows, I took after my mother, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> so no wrestling skills? <laughs> yeah, no. Nor do, my dad was this big, crazy, you know, awesome guy, right? Blonde hair, big blonde beard, and, and was a crazy looking character. So yeah, that's why I say I took after my mother. I love it, I love it. Okay, um, and here, let's see, here's some more. Let's see. We had so many people commenting. Uh, when you can't find the sunshine, be the sunshine. And that is from Nancy, uh, which I love. And okay. Gab Gabriella Bondi, is that, she from Italy, I think? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, the pandemic was kind of like hitting the rest, the rest button. People have become more kind and respectful. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of yeah, sure. comments have come from this. Um, one last question from Ingrid. I don't know where Ingrid is from. I am curious how the, how the way to manage in leadership is going to change. Now more people will be working from home, different kind of cooperation, which yeah. I think you addressed. Yeah, I, I think leaders are going to have to continue to be more empathetic. And we're, we're surely getting that question. And, and some leaders are better at it than others. I think just understanding, you know, how people are working from home and how things are changing on a daily basis and check ins mm -hmm. are going to become a little more important. Um, that's why I said scale from one to 10. Where are you at? Well, I'm at a five. Let's talk. You know, if you're at an eight or nine, I probably am going to move on to the person that's a three or four because eight or nine is pretty good. But yeah, it's going to change dramatically, and I think it's going to put a big burden on those that are leaders, and it should, because we have to continue to make those that we work with and live with feel safe. We have to continue to inspire them. You know, we have to mm -hmm. create meaningful work. We have to still hold each other accountable to the businesses that, you know, we run. But at the end of the day, I think if we do that, we're all going to grow together and be kind to ourselves. And leaders, leaders specifically right now, and I'm kind of even thinking of myself, we have to be kind to ourselves because it's never, we're never going to be enough and we can never do enough, but doing more is better than not. So that's what I would, that's what I would say. Thank you, Lonnie. I even found, I even found myself, sorry, Terry, in, in this moment, Lonnie, um, I've had a, because of what I, what I do as a, as a speaker and communication coach, I 
have all, I've had this boom in this, in this period of um, people need me. They need me to teach their companies and their sales force and their leaders how to communicate well through live video because they, they've never had to do it before. And I've actually noticed that the leaders that are not as kind I just don't really feel like working with them right now because I, it's, it's not, I'm not in a moment. I'm in a, I'm luckily in a moment where I can kind of choose, you know, because I don't have an, an enormous amount of time. So I kind of can choose my clients and I don't really want to work with the people that are just not very nice right now, you know, because there's an, there's an energy out there towards understanding and humanity and kindness right now that has, that was not as present before. Yeah. You just hit on something. You hit on it perfectly. And I, I know we're probably out of time, but yeah. even I have done that. And in the book, we talk about the model of sustainability. And right now, Nancy and I have had to go through this process. We're not excluding anybody from this model of sustainability, but we've had to be very careful who we work with from an energy standpoint, because there are so many people that actually need and want the energy that if you are working with individuals that are taking that energy away, you're actually cheating those that are asking for it the most. So during this time, we're doing our best to help everybody, but we're spending, it's why I'm with you today, we're spending our time with those that are kind of giving as much energy as we're trying to give, because that, that's it. That's where we're all going to rise. The others will come along. Yeah. They will come along, and somebody right. will help them, right? And yeah. we're trying, but right yeah. now, that's, it's key to, to keep good people, you know, pulling everybody along. Even, even leadership at, you know, the political levels and everything like that, it's really difficult right now. People want a beacon of light. That's what they right. want. They do. So thanks, Lonnie, for being that beacon of light. Thank you, yes. guys. Yes. And so, Lonnie, just as we wrap up, this has been so energizing and, and illuminating, wow. and I think you have ignited the human potential today. So I just hope that everybody really focuses on the five pillars of awareness, gratitude, respect, kindness. Um, putting yourself out there and that everyone has a story right. and yeah. together we can really make a difference. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Is, is there one last thing you want to say? You know what? I, I would just say, just keep moving, keep moving, being kind to yourself and incremental, small incremental changes every hour, every day add up over time. And I would just tell you, just keep doing that. And thank you. Grateful to be here with you guys. Thanks Lottie. And thanks Elia. Thank you. And actually with that, Lonnie, I'm going to, I'm going to just say to our viewers that Terry and I have decided to keep moving as well. And so we're from today's show, we're going to take a little pause. Doesn't mean we're not going to have more shows, but um, since the, the economy and, and the world is kind of revving back up, albeit slowly, uh, Terry and I feel the, the desire to just move a little bit and see where it takes us. So we're going to take a little pause with our Facebook Lives. When necessity calls, we will be back. So stay tuned. Of course, we'll let you know when our next show will be. Terry, do you want to tell everyone what you're going to be up to soon? Well, you just, just follow me on Facebook and Instagram, and I will be having some, some educational videos and webinars and um, lots of fun things happening. So we're all just trying to move forward and, and, and inspire the human potential in, in corporations and individuals. So just stay tuned. We'll have more live Facebook Lives coming up. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm about to launch a series of webinars and group programs on public speaking and communication and stuff. So if you want to look on my Facebook page, it's Ellie and Nichols Public Speaking, and I will keep you tuned there. So thank you all for being loyal, wonderful listeners, for writing in all of your questions. Terry and I have felt very grateful to all of you, and we'll see you soon. Absolutely. And we'll answer all your questions. All right. Take care. Thanks again, Lonnie. All right. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks, right. everybody. Bye-bye.